I wanted to just make one or two very brief comments about what you've heard. From, in a sense, a theoretical point of view, we think about our capacity to experience time and space as givens. Let me set space to the side for the moment. The achievement of the capacity to understand what is past, experience what is in the present, and differentiate it from the future, that is an achievement, an achievement which can be lost. When it's lost, the person comes to you fearing something terrible will happen, and you know it has happened. They can't differentiate between fearing for the future and remembering what happened in the past. And so when musically or in other psychological ways, we're able to bear with that dilemma of not knowing what is past, present, or future with the person and enable them to come in step with us as we bring a degree of order in time, separating out the past, the present, and the future, we enable them to become more healthy, to regain that capacity to differentiate. And this is true in a community. In my community, all sorts of things are experienced from the past as though they were happening now and would forever happen. And you look at us and you say, you're mad. Draw a line under it. It's ages ago. Sometimes we do it for fun at, the, at home. You know the Titanic was built in Belfast. They have T-shirts at home that say, she sunk, get over it. You know? The problem is when you're disturbed as an individual or community, you cannot make it into a memory. It is a current experience. It is the present, lived on and on. That's the problem. In a sense, I differ slightly from Simon when he says that it's the memories that can't be put away. It is. They can't be made into memories. They are experienced as current experiences that will go on forever into the future. So the achievement of the capacity to separate out the past, what is over, the future, what may be, and the, the current experience is a major achievement for an individual and for a whole community. And our job is to find ways of coming in step with the chaos and bringing it into some order. The same is true, by the way, in terms of internal and external psychological space, but for today, we stick with the time, which is almost up. I think we've got about how much time, Michael? Five? Ten. Good, for a large group. Um, it's sometimes difficult for us to hear um, up here because of the room, so making a comment or reflection, please take it fairly slowly and speak clearly into the mic. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I'm very encouraged by the connection between the individual and the community in dealing with past, present, and future. Extending this into the application of music therapy and in general the treatment of trauma, is the idea that treating trauma in the individual will actually deal with the trauma in society at large, and is that a strategy? Um, well, maybe if I might have a word about it. I, I don't think so, no. Of course, if you've got a lot of troubled people and you treat them as individuals, that's good, broadly speaking, for the society and the community. But communities function at a different systemic level. Let me put it in reverse. When I started looking at the question of the psychology of terrorists and the psychology of terrorism, why do people get involved in this? There's an expectation by a lot of security agencies and others that you're going to be able to identify a specific disturbance in the individual person which leads them to be a terrorist. And in the overwhelming majority of cases, you can't. In some, you can't, but in most, you can't. Because what is disturbed is the community. And it's being part of that community that reacts in a disturbed fashion 
to what has happened for itself as a community. The community feels humiliated, disrespected, unfairly treated. And the symptom is the individual people who respond in this particular kind of way. So what you've got to do is take the same kinds of principles, and of course there's a moral, to, moral imperative to deal with individual people, but to treat a community that is disturbed, you have to have community interventions. They could potentially be musical, or they might be otherwise. But, but there is a difference between treating the person as an individual person and a whole community of people. And what for me is the past is 10 or 20 or 50 years ago, but what is past for my community might be a thousand years ago. So the principles are similar, but there's a difference. Yes, thank you. Thank you for so interesting talks. But what I was wondering was, um, could you say a little more of when you have the person playing in the depressive phase, how do you decide how long to let them go on and when to try and move them forward? And how much do they need to sort of spend a long time playing the depressive music? It's a difficult question to answer because it is, I think it's, for me it relates more to the way I'm hearing what's happening. And in this particular kind of way where I'm not trying to understand, I'm not trying to move them anywhere in particular, but trying to be, to turn up and be there in that kind of way. So it, for me, the answer to that is, in my work, it's based in how I work to be able to sit there with what it is. And I think that's something that the patient senses. And that's the thing that makes the difference. Can I just get in a quickie while the mic's going to anyone else? Um, there was a paper published, I think, recently in World Psychiatry or somewhere there, uh, interviewing people who had survived natural disasters, tsunami and earthquakes and collapsed buildings and so on. And they were asked, what were their coping strategies? What did they rely on? And actually, I think about 90% referred to their faith, their beliefs, their religious beliefs. I think that's true, more or less. Um, so my sort of comment or reflection in a, what must be an extraordinarily sensitive area is, uh, is religious beliefs, are they seen as a, a coping strategy at a personal level or um, is, it, is it a whole area that's seen as part of the problem? I mean, or is there a sort of compromise that's sensible there? I don't know. John? Yeah. I think, again, th there's... There's a connection, but also a difference between this at an individual level and at a communal level. Um, and, and there's no doubt that the sense individually and com communally of meaning and of purpose is extremely important. One of the things that Simon said when he was talking about PTSD is that actually vulnerability to PTSD is probably as much as anything else about the meaning of the event. And, and so whenever you have an event which seems to be um, caused or brought about by someone that you can point your anger towards, that's different from a situation where you, you can't make any kind of sense out of it at all. Now, when it comes to the question of religious faith, I think there's, there's a very important issue here. It, it's not about the content at all, though that's the bit that gets argued about. It's the process, it's how the meaning is held. Whether it is held in an open, creative, thoughtful, exploratory, reflective way, or whether it's held with a certitude that, can't, that, that is impossible. In other words, whether it becomes fundamentalist. And it doesn't matter what kind of religious faith you've got, if it's held in a fundamentalist way, 
It has all sorts of negative characteristics that are about closing the other out, holding to certitudes of things that you cannot be certain about, and a whole series of other characteristics which at an individual level we might well speak about in a, a psychosis. Do you remember the definition of a delusion? A delusion is a fixed false belief out of kilter with your culture. I always thought that was curious. So what that means is if it's in kilter with your culture, you're not crazy. But your culture might be. Right? So that's, that's the point. And I think this is the thing that's really important. Is religious faith something that helps people engage with the reality of the world with all its difficulties and live out a life? Or is it an approach to faith that has to turn away from realities with all their uncertainty into a fixed false certitude about things which leads to all sorts of trouble. So it's the way that it's held more than even the content. I don't mean the content's not important. Oh. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. Yes, I think Michael is giving me signals that the large group should um, break off uh, for T. Kronos as uh, taken over. And um, sh the speakers are around um, over T. Could you express your thanks to them for leading us in this last hour in such a thoughtful way? Terrific. <laughs>